Music is Life podcast. This is your host, Lou Mavs. Check out everything you need to know about the show over at musicislifepodcast.com. I am joined by a very special guest all the way from the West Coast. I had the pleasure of... <laughs> nice. I had the pleasure of being turned on to his music from Mr. Tony Santana over at Mod Records. He said, you know, it's a little bit more acoustic than what you're used to. It's more indie pop-ish. But I said, hey, as long as it's good, I'll give it a listen. And it's damn good. I know that Music is Life podcast started more as like my love for metal and hardcore, but that was two years ago. People evolve. Things evolve. All I want to do now is just cover good music that the mainstream has no clue of and that Top 40 Radio, or what they call Alternative Radio, won't touch, but I will. This guy's got the goods. I hope I'm pointing it the right direction when the show's up in YouTube, but he's definitely got the goods. I'm really proud to say that I have on my show the person responsible for all the music you hear for the band Human Barbie. And his name is Mr. Christopher Hackman. Chris, since I'm in the evening right now over on the East Coast, good afternoon to you. Hi, good evening. How you doing? Thanks for joining me on the podcast tonight. I'm good. Thanks for having me. I no. wish I was a hardcore band, but uh, not yet. Doesn't pay. Did it for a while. Doesn't pay. <laughs> <laughs> As I mentioned, Tony Santana was the one who turned me on to your music. I gave it a listen. The new album is called Get a Life. It is available on all streaming platforms, and people can purchase it from you on your Bandcamp site. Bandcamp's the best. I feel like, A, you have it on your hard drive, which is not a thing that is common, but I think it's precious and important in a certain way. And then also, like, it's really much more supportive for the artist, even though they do take a small cut. I mm -hmm. make so much more for the time and the work, and it's like eight bucks, so it's like still very minimal for the for someone that's like into the music and wants to help. That's awesome. I know that Bandcap has definitely come a long way from the days of DistroKid, where I think they would take more. Or uh, I assume you've had experience with DistroKid. Oh, I mean, this it's been an ongoing evolution over the past, what, 15 years? I use TuneCore. I've, of many different distributors, I've not used DistroKid, but I've used it a lot. Life was so much more simpler when it was just CD Baby, but thank you. You know, thankfully we have Bandcamp. Your new LP, Get a Life, is available on Bandcamp. I heard the music, and before we begin the interview, I'm just going to give a quick review of the album because I think it's awesome, and I want to tell people why. Uh -oh. from, the, from the first track, We Disappeared. Beatles-esque, somber melodies. Any music that has something comparable to a Mellotron is good enough for me. Reverb-heavy surf guitars, perfect song to listen to while watching a sunset. Don't Run Away, a little jazzy with the piano and the drums with the fan sticks. Again, the melodies and phrasing stand out to me. The lyrical phrasing, that is. And the sax, when done right, it's perfect. And this is done perfect. Accentuates the song. Portrait of a Life in Bloom, Christopher's melodies are his strongest point. They really are. Your vocal melodies are just out of this world. The music works great as it supports his phrasing and melodies. Moments where he reminds me of the indie pop band Ivy, which I love the band Ivy. Nice. Get a Life, the title track, great chorus, and I love the lap steel guitars. Adds to the depth of the song. The Moment, this definitely has a John Lennon vibe. I like it because no one is writing well-crafted pop like this anymore. Mostly the vocals are strong and provides a nice dichotomy with the music, which is more laid back and reserved. See, that's what you get with this. You get dichotomy, which is good in music. The chorus almost sounds like a church choir. Love it. The Crystal Mirror. I love songs in 7th, 8th time because they fall outside of the norm of formula. And on top of that, I hear a harpsichord. Music to my ears. 
And I don't even care how many times this is done in a song. La La La's with multi-layered harmonies rock. Probably my favorite song on the album, which does not have one bad one. The Truth is Coming, you could tell upon first listen, it has that distinct sound reminiscent of what life is like in California. Mm -hmm. Summer, sunsets, sunglasses, surfing, all that and more. It resonates in the music. If the natural statement of songs need to paint a picture rings true, then it rings true in the music alone. The vocals and lyrics only add to the greatness of the music. San Marino is more of like a segue between songs, but very nicely done. And be careful what you wish for. This, the lyrics here have a very dark content, but pressed against the music, you would never guess. Everything about it is so calming, even with the lyrical warning of things not always being what they seem, which is, again, a very interesting use of dichotomy. The truth is that there's more to Human Barbie than just the first listen. It's a sonic experience of highs and lows rolled into one package. What you do with it is up to your interpretation, which is what good songwriting and good songs should do. Congrats on a perfect album, Chris. Ah, thank you, man. Thank you for listening and listening thoughtfully and getting it. You wrong. Well, just remember, I'm not a music critic. I'm a fan, and I only highlight stuff on here that's worthy. So let's get it started. Are you from California originally? I grew up in Wyoming, near the Montana border. That's not California. <laughs> no, there's there's a few key differences. One of them I realized recently, like most people didn't have like their cowboy friends <laughs> like in high school it was like oh that's the cowboy crowd wrangle and like ride bowls and stuff so you really don't hear that much about wyoming i mean my wife and i jested about it we were like would you ever want to visit wyoming and i'm like i don't know anyone in wyoming and i my in-laws went and visited jackson hole wyoming i think where the geysers are yeah yeah, exactly. But now we have someone else famous from Wyoming, and that's you, so that's good. <laughs> oh! What was life in Wyoming like? What was it that exposed you to the music that influenced you? How did it shape the music that you're writing now, or how you've grown or developed as a person? Many ways. I think uh, Wyoming is a land of contradictions, but regardless of what your role is there... It's a land of self-reliance, particularly that played out in, in like learned how to work on cars and I rebuilt a truck for my first vehicle because if your fuel pump goes out or something and you're in, in the middle of nowhere, it's on you to figure out how to get out of that situation. You need to either fix it or, or you know, be able to trust the community to like offer you a helping hand. So I guess, yeah, th that's an interesting dichotomy. Like, the self-reliance versus, like, mutual community trust is really strong. Both are very strong there. I think musically, now that you ask, Wyoming's a bubble, and it's very safe for those that exist there. And that, I think that's very curated, probably not consciously. And there are good things about that, and there's also a dark side to that. But the good thing about it, having randomly shown up there and that, that's where I was born, I had a lot of space to explore music and to practice and to kind of develop a world and a relationship around it that wasn't connected to a scene or a music community. I was just on my own in a little sphere. Was it something that you searched out for or was it something that was maybe brought to your attention through family or friends? It became pretty obvious that it was like, a strength and a passion. When I was a little kid, my grandma gave me these classical music CDs and I just like listened to them all night. At some point, like signed up for the get 10 CDs for a penny, like BMG club. Oh, yeah, Columbia House and all that. I remember it. I had like the randomest collection of CDs and tapes early on that I just became obsessed with. And it was whatever they were like marketing because I forgot to like cancel my subscription. So and then I was getting a CD in the month. And every time I was like, oh God, I have to cancel this. But then I would become addicted to whatever that CD was. So like sometimes it was like Beck's very first album, her first like label album, Mellow Gold, or like, like the best of the cure, or Madonna, or Nine Inch Nails. So Did it I it was alternative rock and alternative forms of music, really, like a big melting pot, almost styles clash the BMG membership gave you. Exactly. And having come to a big city, I've been in LA for 15 years, I think, something like that. Now I'm kind of envious of people that 
are from metropolitan areas because my friends that grew up in cities like there's a scene and there's like underground records and there are like cool bands that you can go see and there's like a whole different way of relating to music that was just not just unavailable but utterly unknown to me i'm sure that had some kind of impact yeah i could see that having grown up myself in new york city in the borough of queens and knowing that there were places that you could go to to see either your friend's band or to see a touring act that was either doing it on their own or they were on such a small label that they weren't getting any money for it but there was something there i know for a fact the hardcore scene with a lot of the people who were of youthful age at the time they just picked venues and they just picked up instruments and they wrote songs one minute blastful songs they just sort of created their own scene because they weren't into the arena rock at the time at that time punk had become new wave and people were kind of getting tired of that they couldn't relate to the vidal sassoon hair and makeup and things like that so that's pretty much why a scene like that started in the boroughs but i completely get what you mean by there not being a scene in wyoming but the fact that you were able to cultivate all that experience just from a cd membership and just let it nurture you in a way to get where you are now is pretty amazing and again it means that physical media does have a purpose. Oh, holy smokes. Yeah. I mean, it's so different. Now, it'll never be that way. There are many levels. When you have an artifact of music that you love and you're connected with emotionally, especially at that age, but at any age, and then, like, they cost 20 bucks, which even today is, like, not meaningless amount of cash to invest in, like, a piece of art that you're connected with. And I feel like there was something about the sunk costs and then the scarcity attached to that made the music very magical. I agree with that. I mean, to me, there's just something magical about holding a physical product that someone takes time out of their day to just kind of put it together, whether it's on wax like vinyl or whether it's on plastic like CD. I mean, don't get me wrong. The convenience of MP3s are great. And, you know, I do have an Apple Music subscription. But still, I know that when you buy the physical product from the artist, it puts money directly into their pocket. People really need to understand that. Hopefully with the pandemic going away as we speak and live music coming back up, maybe people will take more stock in supporting the artists directly because they kind of took it for granted. And that's wishful thinking, but that's kind of what I hope for people like you and others that are doing it. Me too. I mean, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? It's fine. Spotify is incredible as a user. Streaming, YouTube, the, like I've discovered more music through these sources than I ever would otherwise, even though my $10 a month goes mostly to Daniel Ek. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Some dude from Sweden. Uh, <laughs> so we'll see. And then this is clearly just a temporary system. Something will come to replace it and it remains to be seen how artists even relate to that new system it's just ongoing well we'll have to wait and see i mean you know we had the vinyl then we had a track vinyl and cassettes still came back a track was gone then cds came out vinyl was gone then cassettes were gone and somehow everyone's back to buying vinyl but <laughs> hey, hey it's great audio experience so moving from wyoming to la that's a pretty big gamble. What was it about L.A. that attracted you to there? was, and, and when you went to L.A., did you already have songs written? Or was it not until you went to L.A. that you finally found inspiration to writing the music that you wanted? I was writing already at that time. But again, very nurtured, very bubble kind of environment. But I came out for music school so i got to kick the can even a few years down the road of like having to interface with reality and spent the time practicing writing some songs playing bass i i was studying upright bass and like learning jazz and all that kind of stuff and then at some point after finishing up with school it became really clear like i'm not just gonna play jazz shows in dinner clubs and stuff like i have a really powerful calling or sense of how I want to have my life go 
that involved writing and recording and performing and touring my own music. I feel like I got to it pretty late in the game for someone to play in a band, in a sense, in that I never did it as a teenager or even well into my 20s, but it was inevitable, again, in some sense. I understand what you mean by thinking that it might be too late to start. It's never too late to start. I mean, I think of one of my heroes, Lemmy from Motorhead. You know, he was in... Um, Hawkwind for the better part of his 20s, but he didn't start Motorhead till he was 30 years old nice. and still living like a pauper trying to tour and sell records. And it wasn't until he was 35 when he first came to the States. So it's never too late. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, that's just nonsense thinking for sure. I think of everything as right place, right time. And for you to write and craft songs like you did for Get a Life, it was meant to be for it to come out at this point. So good on you for that. Thanks. Yeah, it definitely had to incubate. When you decided that you were done with playing the jazz clubs or the uh, the dinner clubs, did you search out for musicians there that were like-minded, or was it always something that you were going to do on your own? No, and there are two big collaborative experiences that kind of led to Human Barbie in its current form. The first was two really dear close friends from Wyoming who came out also to LA. It was a band called Green Horse that was like fast, intense electronic music with guitar and we were singing and yelling and like jumping around and our drummer played like this hybrid electronic acoustic Terminator kit. Terminator we were- kit? <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, the kick drum had this, like, weird, like, mechanical eye-looking thing on the back of it. Oh, sort of, like, shot, like, a red beam out when it was hit on impact, I guess? Uh, Oh, my gosh. I wish we would have thought of that. I mean, we had lasers. Don't get me wrong. There's lasers and fog. We were unchained, and we were going for it. One of the band members had been an assigned band in the UK on Columbia, and he had just come out of that experience. And so we were fully of the mentality of, like, go big, go hard, get signed, but this was like 09, 2010, 2011, just when that was gone forever, and not a thing almost anyone will ever experience again. But we hadn't got the memo, and so we just went nuts. And I feel like that energy still persists today in some weird, there's some weird like gonzo aspect about trying to be in a band and like book shows and go on tours and sleeping on floors. Oh, there definitely is. I mean, I know some people who still want to live the dream. Um, I have lived the dream and I can tell you for me, it was a nightmare, (laughs) but, (laughs) but everyone's experience is different and it's relative to their needs and their wants. I live a life of domesticity right now, but I'm, perfectly happy with that. I use the platform now just to promote what I'm doing musically because as someone who writes songs, you're always going to write. You're always going to find outlets to release it. And for me, I enjoy doing it more as a hobby now than anything. But I do know that I could share that hobby with others who are looking to make it and giving them that their exposure. Like I said, when I heard Get a Life and the single 1980, which I absolutely love, that's what made me say, oh my God, people need to know about this dude. But I will say this though, I do remember when that, bu- <laughs> I do remember when that bubble with the music industry, I guess you could say exploded in 2011 where things didn't always happen the way certain people wanted. Record labels just started signing everything that at that point was homogenized, not willing to experiment with new artists or new music. Kind of reminds me of a quote that Frank Zappa once said that, The record industry was great when it was just fat guys in suits just handing out droves of money to anyone who was creative and just said, here, release an album. I don't care if it sells. Just go out. Just do do what you want with it. You know, and he's like, and we could we were left to our own devices to write what we wanted and they were able to capitalize off it. Kind of miss those days. Not that I lived them, but, (laughs) you know, that's kind of the way that. I wish that the music industry would treat people, but again, their bottom line is more profit over people. With the different avenues that we spoke of, such as Spotify, Apple Music, Bandcamp, YouTube, and with Google itself, there are more avenues for people in positions like you to look up how to create your own publishing companies, 
how to copyright your music, how to self-release your own music, how to promote it, how to tour behind it. So were you able to take advantage of any of those resources? While oh, completely. Um, that's ongoing. And I view that as an ongoing practice that is just indefinite for as long as I'm making music. I think the first of those things that you mentioned that I really tried to learn about and went deep with is publishing. And I found a bunch of kind of agents that tried to get your music and TV and film. Then I worked for a couple publishing companies, got a couple film gigs, and then I kind of saw along the way, I made some bad deals, got some cool things to happen. The situations where I gave away too many rights are so painful. They suck so bad. And not wanting that to ever happen again, I now make sure that I own everything that I make. And if I offer a license or the ability to secure a license it's non-exclusive because inevitably the best deals the best situations i personally got and so it sucks when you sign with a publisher exclusively and then you get your song in a movie and then you have to pay half of that to your publisher who didn't get the movie for you and i had some version of that experience a few times and then i was like screw this i'm just doing it on my own the resources like you mentioned are there it's complex but to me it's been worth it i wholeheartedly agree i think it's important for recording artists performing artists you know anyone who wants to do this as their livelihood to really take advantage for that and someone told me this one statement in the corporate world, but I think it also definitely caters to the artistic world as well. You are your own best advocate. Having been mentioned to me by Tony Santana, good company is always helpful. And having people like that to promote you around by word of mouth alone, hoping that it leads to something greater, that's an asset that you can't buy. It's something that's just based on civility. It's based on honor, which I'm sorry, those are two things that don't exist anymore. But it's great to see that he lives by those convictions. How was it that you became associated with Tony Santana? Through a mutual friend, Thomas Keha, who has the coolest studio in LA, hands down, probably. Oh, it's so sick. Energy is so great. Tony was in a kind of like a member of the studio at the time. And Thomas and I had been in a band together, which is kind of like my second LA iteration. So me and the Wyoming boys, we went hard. And then it came time, for whatever reason, to shelve it, and people kind of went their different directions. By that time, I was becoming a lot more fascinated by, like, 60s folk music, 70s rock, funk. Not necessarily writing, but the sound of those older recordings of that era were just so transporting and magical to me. So I started a huge band, Thomas was part of it, and I met... Tony through his studio. We were the Fuzzy Crystals. Was that studio by any chance the one that you recorded at? Was that Majestic Wizard Studios? Oh, that's just my apartment. Oh! <laughs> you fooled me. It sounded good. <laughs> okay. Branding! Love it. I agree with you about those 70s records. Like, I'm a really big fan of a lot of the jazz fusion that came out of the 70s. And I just love the way they were recorded. And I remember discussing this with George Fullen, who has produced Cindy Lauper, Alicia Keys, and even artists such as Biohazard and even a black metal band called Black Anvil. Nice. Um, it's just something about those musicians from the 70s. It's like they didn't have a lot of money, so they didn't have a lot of time. So they mastered their craft. They went in, banged out kick-ass sounding records. Honestly... I put that up against anything today. I mean, just the sound of it. I mean, that, that crisp, warm sound of them into a microphone being recorded and, you know, through analog. I just, I love it. But yeah, do you record digitally or, an, uh, or via analog? Because I'm, I'm telling you, one could listen to this and think, oh my God, is he, is he actually recording like with an old school method? Did you cheat? Did you read about the album? I only read what I read on the bio that was sent to me, what I read from the band camp. Nice. Yeah. I tracked everything to tape on this album. I knew there was something awesome about it. This didn't sound like no freaking album that suffered <laughs> from the loudness war of Pro Tools. 
Yeah, no Pro Tools. Ironically, I've discovered since then, I mean, the Sonics of tape, they're cool. You can achieve them with digital or with outboard without going to tape. But the I think the most powerful aspect of that on this, it was criminally brutal. I kind of wanted to punish myself with that experience. It's the workflow, because you only have... In my case, 15 tracks, maybe 14, one of them is busted or something. So you have to plan everything very strategically. In your mind, you need to know what instruments are going to be on the song as far as arrangement. And then as you go, if there's anything that's imperfect or that's merely good, but it needs to be great, you lose whatever was there before. And so the way that manifested was, uh, because I played not everything, but a lot of I'd say the vast majority of what's on the album. I'm not a great guitarist, and so I would. Just, I beg to differ. It took. It was like take after take after take, and the worst is if you get one that's like ninety percent. But I would know, like in my heart, like ah, uh, it didn't really capture what needs to happen here, and so you just go over it and then play it wrong, and then do twenty more until you finally get to the point where it feels right. Well, I have to admit, job well done. Thanks. Because it sounds like it could hold up against some of the classic recorded material from that era that which you discussed. It holds up with them. It's good enough to say that it sounds vintage and new at the same time. And if it sounds like I'm blowing smoke up your ass, I apologize. It's just, and, I, and, and, and trust me, if I thought the album stunk, I wouldn't have you on here, but it doesn't. It's good. It's damn good. And people really need to hear it. I'm proud to say you've made a fan out of this podcast. Yeah! <laughs> if that means anything. but <laughs> It does. It does. It does. Thank you so much. I assume Poor Man is also your own record label. When I recorded the album, I was like, I'm going to send it to a couple of labels and then I'll just put it out myself. Or whatever and i booked a few shows poor man is a label owned by my friends alex and amber who i've known in, in la for a minute we met through the fuzzy crystals at some shows and they were just at a show and alex was like hey do you want to talk about collaborating on a release with some music i've actually never had the experience of working with a label before and so I thought I'd take a leap of faith and give it a shot. And I'm so happy. It's been an amazing experience. Were your friends able to provide you a safety net? Or was it sort of you knew from the beginning that this was a business relationship, but it was one that you had with friends? So there was a, a sort of like a trust, like an honor code there. Yeah, it was so chill. We talked about it beforehand. Like I had never planned on you doing physical. We just pooled some resources. They had some PR. I had some PR. Amber is also awesome at that and has been hyping the record. And we were like, cool, if something like blows up, we'll make some CDs and do a tour. Or if we get on a crazy playlist and get 100,000 plays or something, like, you know, we'll do vinyl, a short run. And it still felt very DIY, but just like three people that have a lot of experience with that indie kind of release approach working together. It's been sick. What are some of the future plans that you have to promote it? Do you plan on touring behind it or just playing sort of locally, maybe between California as far north as maybe Washington or as far east as like maybe Oregon or anything like that? Like, is there any plan to do any kind of coastal United States tour or even a continental United States tour? For this album, probably the window for that is past. Because we, we'd planned a residency. I was going to do a tour in the fall of 2020. And we planned a residency around the album release. A bunch of shows lined up in, in L.A. And then COVID kind of wiped all of those plans away. Boo! And so we just regrouped and changed our focus. And I'm stoked. So that that's going to be down the line. But probably West Coast, like 6, 10 days. That's pretty doable and my experiences with national touring is that it's draining and unless you already have a fan base across you know in the places that you're going to be playing in just having the experience of touring becomes its own objective because you're going to be playing shows in brooklyn for six people 
and then maybe randomly one of the shows will be popping off in Boston or New Orleans or whatever. I'm not established enough to really logistically plan on a national tour. Have you thought of possibly hitting up any independent marketing companies to get your material out to alternative or college radio stations? to sort of start building a fan base. Yeah, that's an evolving mindset. I'd like to do college radio. We had talked about it, and then it, it made a little bit less sense with COVID because no one was at colleges. I, I meant for future reference, not for the past 15 months. I apologize. I'm trying to think progressively and move ahead. Cause... Oh, completely, completely, completely. Yeah, and my entire understanding of what it means to like bring music to people is definitely in flux. And one thing that I've discovered, probably partially because of just it being 2021, and partially because we released the album in a pandemic completely digitally, is that people all over the world have connected with the music. And it kind of occurred to me, like, oh, this is my friend group in some way. Someone that took the time to like l listen to my album and send me a message on Instagram or like comment on a YouTube, that's so dope to me and like i have affection for that people and you know we chat back and forth sometimes they have questions about how i recorded it and so it feels like there's almost a networked community around the music small though it may be so that's on my mind um, moving forward with how do i get the next group batch of music out to the people that really are gonna care the most outside of california or even the united states have you gotten reaction from any fans on an international basis? Yeah, like in particular, South America rocks. And also I've kind of like discovered a few like shoegaze, lo-fi, even like dream pop bands from Mexico and South America. But bedroom pop and lo-fi music is popping off in, in South America, which is really cool to me to feel connected to a culture somewhat outside of my own it is very cool and if there's one thing i gotta say i love watching concert video footage from south american countries because the fans are knucking futs <laughs> to put it plain and simple rock and rio in brazil always seems to be like one ongoing party where there's artists of all genres and it doesn't end until like four in the morning and i think they're already getting ready for the next day and nobody leaves it's insane. That's beautiful to me. Yeah, probably Europe if I were a black metal band, but ah. I'm, not, I'm not a black metal band. Or a power metal band. <laughs> That's always big. Running in place while, with their fists up in the air and just headbanging. But uh, we're not here to talk about metal. We're here to talk about you. I can Swing hold of off my personal biases for another day. It's fine. Swing of the axe. That <laughs> Oh, I appreciate your talking cheek humor about it. Anywhere in particular in South America, Brazil or um... Brazil, Peru, and Mexico have been people that have popped off, popped up. That's um, awesome. Yeah, we'll see. But to speak to your question, I definitely want to do college radio next time around. Not because college kids listen to the radio. I think largely they kind of don't. But college radio DJs love music because otherwise, why would you do it? And they are open to discovering new things and that's just the exact like type of person that i want to meet and connect with well my friend it's funny you mentioned that because i was a college radio dj sick and what what was your experience hell no <laughs> it was great i was the assistant music director my sophomore year at st john's university and i was a dj from the second semester of my freshman year on so i was responsible for getting in touch with the labels and having them send us material for playing on the radio and also giving stuff away for like contests and things like that and i can't even begin to tell you how many different artists i was exposed to when i was there and yes you have to have a genuine love for doing it i'm grateful that i was able to get some grant money for it again it was more of a passion than it was potential career path. You know, the difference between college radio and mainstream radio, as we all know, college radio doesn't really follow a specific format. It's sort of, well, you played all this different kind of music from Europe, so fine, you could do that for an hour. Or, oh, you like to play uh, lo-fi indie pop, so you could do that for one hour. Oh, you're the metal guy? 20 minutes. You know, it's yeah. just, <laughs> it was just great being, being able to 
allow myself to be exposed to different personalities, different tastes. I've held on to it. And it's part of the reason why I even started this podcast in the first place was because, again, this is a passion project for me and I don't have to worry about and upsetting any corporate sponsorships. I don't want to say it's like I'm back in college again, but it's extending my love for the music and giving love to artists who I believe need to be heard. Beautiful. That's why you're here. <laughs> yeah. Love your enthusiasm. And you haven't stopped smiling since we started this interview. I appreciate that so much. Too much somberness in the world. You know, that's valid. I just glad to be here. I'm stoked to spend time with musicians and music lovers and human Barbie. Same. It's just like a passion project for sure. I wouldn't be doing it if it didn't mean a lot to me. So that makes me happy. How did the name Human Barbie come up? Because I have to admit that I was wondering if you maybe you got your name by this person who decided that they wanted to look like a human Barbie and they actually went through facial and bodily reconstructive surgery to look like a human Barbie, even though they look more like an anime character. But is that where you got the name from or was it just something like Human Barbie? Just put two words together and... That's it. Like, what was it that made you come up with the name? It's connected to her tangentially. Do I do my research or what, people? <laughs> Even Barbie is uh, like our whole culture. It's beautiful on the outside, but empty within. It's just a clickbaity word. And at the time when I was starting it, as you can tell from the lyrics, it's very like bittersweet, melancholy. And even though the music is very cheerful. Explain um, the dichotomy behind it. Yep, we're getting deep, people. To me, like, culture is vapid. It was, like the, it was the BuzzFeed moment where it was like, cool, whatever, nothing matters. This is very nihilistic. I'm just going to put a name on it that's kind of buzzy, that's already a thing that's way better known, and maybe we'll get confused or something. But also there's a deeper meaning to it, which is that sense of yearning that fuels something like transforming yourself to become a Barbie doll is a deep sense of pain, a deep sense of suffering, and a deep sense of wanting to change something. And I resonate with that feeling so much. Like, oh, maybe if I put out the next album, my career, career will really take off. Or maybe if I find XYZ producer, if I use whatever PR, if I change XYZ about my sounds, maybe then people will like it. And so it, it's facetious in a way, but also deeply resonant with like that very human yearning for transformation and to break through whatever made up limitations we've placed on ourselves. That is such a profound answer. Um, wow. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. That, that, to, to, coin, to coin the millennials, that got me right in the feels. I loved uh, it. <laughs> Well, I definitely think you're on the right track, but what matters most is should be what matters to you. Where do you want to take this, and how far do you think you could take it? I guess the big thing is I'm collaborating with a couple friends, Justin and Ed and Jesse, on a project called Life of Ed, which if you've checked out my YouTube page, or if you do check it out, um, it'll be pretty clear. But they heard the album, Ed and Justin heard the album, and they and Jesse were working on, like, a movie in San Francisco that kind of got derailed. But then Justin was editing footage of that, of the movie, to one of my songs, Don't Run Away. And it just really fit in this strangely cinematic, kind of vintage, melancholy way. And so Justin and Ed hit me up, and they were like, hey what if we do a music video for the whole album and base it on Ed's life, like a fictionalized version of Ed's life, who in a way he, he's like a stand-in or a representative of a lot of the experiences I've had in LA and also Justin. Ed's an actor, he's a musician, but he also hustles and scrapes by in all of the many ways. That's what we're working on now. We have five videos done and I guess that means three left to go. All right. I'll definitely be on the lookout for that. The last question that we'll ask is if people want to know more about you, Mr. Chris Hackman, or about Human Barbie, <laughs> where can the good people find you? 
Instagram's probably best. The Real Human Barbie. Also, Spotify is great. And my YouTube channel, which is YouTube slash C slash Human Barbie. I promise I will have all the links down below in the description. So we hope to generate some traffic for you. Sick! <laughs> Chris Hackman, the brains behind Human Barbie. I can't thank you enough for being a part of the Music is Life podcast with this schmuck right here. Ah. And I really enjoyed having you on the show, talking with you about the inner workings of your music. Please consider me a fan, and I will purchase whatever I can on any format that I can, and I will speak the good word of Human Barbie to everyone who will listen. And if not, I'll pry their ears open until they have no choice. Hell yeah. Dude, Lou, thanks for having me on. You rock. You know, uh, looking forward to talking again in the future. Absolutely. Please consider this an open invitation to come back anytime. Anytime you're promoting anything new or whenever you're ready to discuss with your friends, Ed, and I'm sorry, the other person that you're working with on this project, we'll be happy to discuss that too. Dope. And, you know, if I ever meet you in real life, maybe we can talk about my deep passion for funeral doom. Funeral doom? Are you a metalhead? <laughs> Dang, we could have had a whole discussion about this, but I'd rather talk about his music. You know, that's fine, too. They're both good. There's more for us to discuss. You will be back, and I, I will haunt you until we have this discussion. Chris, again, I can't thank you enough. The name of the album is called Get a Life. The artist, Human Barbie. The brains, Mr. Chris Hackman. Thank you so much. Hell yeah. To find out more about the Music is Life podcast, please check us out over at musicislifepodcast.com. Also, please check out our parent network, Ratsaw Review, over at ratsawreview.com. Check out some of the other podcasts on that show, including Beyond Bushido, which is a pro wrestling MMA show with James and EA. Also check out The Vieira Vault with Ralph Vieira of the Rock and Metal Combat Podcast and the bands Thrash or Die and Combat. Also, don't forget to check out Suck My Balls, the South Park podcast. Everyone reacts the same way to that. Oh, yeah. And also check out Old Man Metal's Musings. Check out Wayne and the great Harry Barnett over at Sporadically 3D. And I think, oh yes, and also check out Harrison Bergeron over at The Right Opinion. So if you like what you see on the show, please hit me up over at lumavs at musicislivepodcast.com. Don't forget the good name of Ratsaw Review, Music is Live Podcast, Human Barbie. And again, Chris, thanks for joining me tonight. And thank you for watching or listening. Whatever you do, I appreciate it. Please like, subscribe, comment. Tell me I suck, but tell Chris he rocks. I don't care. It's all good. You and rock. we'll thank you, sir. And we'll see you on the next show. Don't forget, all art is valid. Have a good night. 